Shalom, shalom to everyone watching. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero. In this morning, we're going to continue the learning of Rabbi Yosef Albo, his Sefer Hai Karim, which many have commented a lot of positive things, and we need to um, move forward on this. We're now going to be looking at chapter 15 this morning, Sefer Hai Karim. And he begins to, um, Abba begins to look at the, the second principles, which are based on the three primary principles, which he, we have mentioned already and derived from them, which are a total of eight, according to Rabbi Abba. From the first principle, the existence of God are derived four secondary principles, including all of those things implied in the existence of God, who is a necessary existence. They are also, uh, they all, they are all as follows. Unity, as we explained in the above, in corporality. God is neither a body nor a corporal power. Independence of time, of freedom from defects. It is clear from the nature of everyone that there are these, that they are these four principles that they follow essentially from the very principle of the existence of God. For if God is not one without any composition, he is not necessarily existent. Similarly, if he is a body or a corporal power, likewise, if he is dependent upon time, existing in one time and not another, time is either prior to him or post posterior, as we shall see. And he is neither eternal, and he is neither eternal or perpetual. This is based upon the notion it doesn't exist. This is our reason for counting the independence of time as a principle rather than eternity, as Maimonides does. For independence of time includes both eternity and perpetuity. Maimonides, who counts eternity as a separate principle, should have counted perpetuity also as a separate principle. God's freedom from defect we lay down as a principle in order to show that the necessary existence is not liable to sleep or forgetfulness, or fatigue, and the like. Also, to indicate that all of those attributes which God must have, like power, will, and others, without which he would be defective, as, as ascribed to him in a manner that will not result in a defect in his nature. Precisely in what way these attributes and others are ascribed to God will be made clear in uh, Rabbi Albo's second book, which we're coming close to getting getting into. The dogma is based upon the second principle of Rabbi Joseph Albo. Divine revelations are three. God's knowledge, God's prophecy, or the prophecy that comes from God, the genuineness of the divine messenger, and it is clear from the nature of these three that they are necessarily followed from revelation. For if God does not know terrestrial existence, prophecy cannot come from him, nor a revealed Torah. Even assuming that God does not, that God does know terrestrial existence, there will be no divine Torah unless there is prophecy, and the information communicated by God to man. And even if there is such a thing as prophecy, by which man is informed of the future, and given specific commandments to be followed by him and his descendants, like the commandments, for example, of circumcision given to, to Abraham, men would not have to obey the alleged prophet unless it is proven that he is a divine messenger sent to communicate to the people the commands of God. For this reason, belief in the genuineness of the messenger is a major principle common to all divine laws. For if we are convinced that the messenger is genuine, whether he be a man of the greatest ability or not of the greatest, it is possible that a general and adequate code should be given through him by God to lead mankind to eternal happiness. This is the meaning of divine revelation. The reason why we did not include the superiority of Moses as a prophet among the principal, primary, or secondary, as Maimonides did, for nothing should be regarded as fundamental principle unless a divine law cannot be conceived without it, nor as a secondary principle, unless it follows necessarily from the fundamental principles. 
But the superiority of, a, of Moses as a prophet does not necessarily follow from a belief in a genuine character of the messenger, though it may be compared to a branch issuing from it. If we were to count it all, it would be a special principle of law of Moses. But insomuch as conviction of the genuine character of the particular messenger of a given religion is a special dogma of the religion in question, and the intensity of the belief in that given religion varies with intensity of conviction in the genuine, genuine character of the messenger. So we did not find it necessary to count the superiority of Moses as a special principle of the law of Moses, for as long as, there, as the genuineness of its mission has been verified, it's not necessary to verify the rank he holds among the prophets. The question, the manner in which the authenticity of the mission must be verified beyond all doubts will be discussed later on. The question why we regard divine revelation as a fundamental principle and prophecy as a derivative principle following from the former will be explained in the third book, not the second, the third. As to the third principles, Rabbi Albo says, reward and punishment, and the second principle, which is prior to the essential to its providence, for although we have already assumed that God's knowledge that he knows the deeds of men in order their affairs by means of a divine law so that their social life may be permanent and well conditioned still be said that the reason of man's inferiority a, a, a little esteem in the eyes of God the individual ignored and not recompensed for his specific conduct in relations to his maker and that he is taken into account merely as a part of the whole and not as an individual for this reason we regard the providence as a principle that is prior to reward and punishment in order to call attention that the fact of the divine providence extends to every individual and recompenses him for his individual revelations to God as we are told that God did not have respect unto Cain and his offering and more especially for the dealing of, with his fellow man. As the prophet says, great in the counsel and, the, and mighty in the work whose eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Retribution is of two kinds, corporeal and spiritual. The principle, the principle there, therefore, includes both. We did not even think it proper to name corporeal and spiritual retribution as, as two separate principles, for the reason that some of our rabbis say that the reward given for the obedience to God's commandment is not in this world. Corporal retribution, therefore, could not be counted as a separate principle according to my opinion, says Rabbi Albo. Hence, I lay down <clears throat> reward and punishment as one principle, including both kinds. It will represent spiritual recompense to those who think that the main retribution is spiritual and not corporal. And those who believe in both kinds, it will stand for both together. And thus, the number of primary and secondary principles of divine law in general, according to this, are 11. The existence of God, the four secondary principles derived from it, the unity, the incorporeality, the independence of time, the freedom from defect, the divine revelation and three secondary principles depending upon it, God's knowledge, prophecy, and authenticity of the prophet's mission. Finally, the reward and punishment, and secondarily or secondary principle based upon upon it, which we call providence. If we combine divine knowledge and providence into one, as Maimonides does, the number will be ten. It's clear that they should not all be called fundamental principles because they are not equally essential to divine law. Thus, if one were to be were a dualist or believe the corporeality of God, or that God is subject to time, this would not throw the divine law entirely, except for the fact that they are based upon the principle of the existence of God, and one who denies any one of them is virtually denying the fundamental principles, since he does not believe in the proper manner. For this reason, we did not treat them all alike as fundamental principles, as Maimonides does. Now notice how Albo Makes a, di makes a distinction between what he is presenting and that of which Rabbi Maimonides or Rambam presented. 
the superiority of Moses and the immutability of the law we regard as neither fundamental nor derivative principles, because they are not essential to divine law. They are merely like branches issuing from the beliefs in the authenticity of the prophet's mission. If they are principles at all, primary and secondary, they are peculiar to the law of Moses and not common to divine law. Thus, the belief in the Messiah, in the resurrection of the dead, are dogmas peculiar to Christianity, which we cannot conceive without them. Notice what he says. Keep in mind, this is exactly what Alba was dealing with during his period of time, which was the Christian notion that put Messiah concept all in the framework of everything they believed, like other groups within the Jewish fold. But the law of Moses can be conceived as existing without the belief of superiority of Moses and the mutality of the law. It is better to say, therefore, that they are like branches issues from a belief in the authenticity of the lawgiver's mission, not dependent on these principles. Similarly, the resurrection, the messiahs, are like branches issuing from the dogma of reward and punishment and independent principles, primary and secondary, common to all divine laws, or peculiar to the law of Moses. Nor do we, or could, uh, nor we count the duty of worshiping God alone as a principle, because it is a specific command, and must be counted as a principle, primarily or secondary, as we have explained in the preceding, uh, the preceding videos. On the other hand, we count God's knowledge and providence as two separate dogmas, because they're different, as Maimonides explained in the guide of Maimonides. And all the later authorities agree, though Maimonides himself combines them two, those two into one. Now, we do not include freedom of choice and general purpose among the principles fundamental or derived, though they are essential to um, divine law, which cannot be conceived without them because they are not essential to divine law qua divine. And thus, and thus, as was said before, but the special purpose of divine law, namely spiritual reward and punishment, we do not count, or we do count, I'm sorry, among the fundamental principles because it is essential to divine law. Freedom of choice, however, is not essential to divine law qua divine, and therefore is not counted among the principles, which fundamental or derived, nevertheless, in so much as it is essential to divine law, it is presupposed by it. We will explain this in the fourth book as he develops this concept in the, the latter books. So much concerning the number of dogmas, fundamental and derivative, blessed be the one who gives aid and determines. Amen, amen, says Rabbi Albo. And I would agree with that amen. Now, we just finished chapter 15 in which he tries to make the distinction and he does a very good job in what he is summarizing as basics and which he disagrees with Maimonides in this point, seeing that Maimonides perhaps expands considering dogmas as actual essential elements of fundamentals where he disagrees in that point. So in, in chapter 16, we're going to be looking at some ancient thinkers who have denied the possibility of knowledge. And that we'll look at chapter 16 in our next video of Sefer Haikarim. Continue with us and remember that by learning you grow in your faith in God. All of this he's putting forward as an argument eventually to those who embrace the notion of Christianity's incarnality or um, the idea of God-man situation and a lot of the basic dogmas which Christianity and Judaism somewhat differs in essential fundamentals or beliefs. So stay tuned with us and remember, be part of the Ways of Israel and join us every morning for a portion of the Sefer Haikarim, which will give you the basic fundamentals from a perspective of Rabbi Albo, a Spanish Jewish, uh, not only theologian, but a scholar of his time as well. And may God bless you and strengthen you and share this video with as many friends as you can. Shalom, shalom, 
and thank you for being with us here on the Ways of Israel.